Welcome to the Science Salon Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. We bring you these podcasts once a week. Nonfiction authors of new books this week is Leaving the Witness, Exiting a Religion and Finding a Life by Amber Scora. Amber is a, a former Jehovah Witness, and this is her memoir of her life as a witness uh, in Vancouver, then in China. And, uh, and then she, how she lost her religion and now lives in New York City as a writer. And uh, so her book is about that. And our conversation is very wide ranging um, in which I try to um, use her specific examples from her memoir to explore deeper themes about uh, the purpose of religion, what role it serves in people's lives, um, the whole idea of, of the end of the world, the apocalypse, what kind of psychological beliefs are behind that, the role that that plays human history and in human beliefs. Uh, we talk about a religion's obsession with sex, particularly female sexuality, uh, this, you know, just ages long, uh, just obsession with controlling uh, women's reproductive uh, choices. Uh, we get into um, finding meaning and purpose uh, uh, and happiness in life and so on with religion and without. Uh, do we need to replace it with something um, her own tragedies she's gone through, which she writes about in the book uh, of the loss of her son and how that would have felt had she been a witness as opposed to not a believer now. And, uh, and then finally, we just kind of cover the broad range of, of, uh, of deconversion. Uh, what does it take to talk somebody out of or reason somebody out of a belief that they didn't reason their way to in the first place? That is, if you were born and raised a particular religion or whatever your ideology is. How do you talk somebody out of that? So we, we spent a lot of time on that because I think it's a super important topic. I actually asked her, if you met somebody that wanted to go join ISIS, what would you say to them to try to talk them out of it? You can't just say, if you go do that, you're probably going to die. They're looking forward to death. They want to be martyrs. She herself said she would have died in the name of, of, uh, of the Jehovah Witnesses had she been asked to. She maybe would have even killed in the name of her religion at the time when she was a true believer. That's the mentality of the true believer uh, that we explore. Uh, if you appreciate these podcasts and enjoy them, please support us. We need your support at skeptic.com slash donate or just go to skeptic.com. You can find it there. We're also on Patreon. And as always, I appreciate your support of the podcast. Hi, Amber. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for coming on the show and congratulations on the new book, Leaving the Witness. Thank you. I love the title, Exiting a Religion and Finding a Life. Uh, I like the cover design with the little, uh, you know, one one uh, arc there bent out of shape or escaping the fold or I don't know what that is. That's sort of, me. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's you. Yeah. So I, I listen. I never got the uh, the review copy, so I listened to it twice on audio. So I now know your voice uh, oh, very well. I'm sure you get it right after this podcast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should know. Know, I should note parenthetically. I like it when authors read their own books because I, I I feel like they know what to emphasize and you know when when to punch this syllable or whatever to make a point. Right. Yeah, it's true. I, I feel like I'm not an overly dramatic person, and I didn't realize that in reading your own story, you can't help but kind of you understand the drama you can't help but sort of get into the emotion of it it was it was an interesting experience i think so yeah i um i mean wow. richard, richard dawkins reads all his own books hitchens did that as well uh, i like that uh for my authors so by the way just to dive into it in a in a quirky way so saturday night i am sitting on my couch typing out notes for our conversation with jeopardy on in the background you know jeopardy right the game show yeah so we get to Double Jeopardy, the final category no one would touch, religion. The huh. last question, uh, the last clue for $2,000, it is, let's see, uh, I have to read it here because it's backwards on there. Citing Hebrews 11 and 12, 1, this religious group considers Abel to be the first of their name. You see? Yes. Okay. What's, what's the religion? <laughs> I guess it, is it Jehovah's Witnesses? <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, I, I wouldn't. I, I, fail at Jeopardy. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have gotten it either. But they, Jeopardy clues always have a second, uh, second clue. So the UC is the witness part. But I don't get the. Uh, I don't I, get. 
I, 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 I didn't know Jehovah Witnesses consider Abel to be the first of their name. That doesn't make sense. Maybe I guess he's the first witness of Jehovah. Maybe they view it that oh. way. It's funny because I don't really, as a Jehovah's Witness, I don't remember that being talked about much, but it's probably somewhere in there. I guess Jeopardy, after all these years, they got to really scour to get new questions, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of bizarre. This group considers Abel to be the first of their name because Jehovah is the first of their name or Adam would be the first man. Abel. Well, I think it's been a long line of people who were considered witnesses of Jehovah and, and probably they're citing Hebrews because if I remember, I you know, it's <laughs> I forget so much of the, what we yeah. studied it. Yeah, yeah. But I think there's probably a list of witnesses that, you know, they consider Jehovah's Witnesses. They're sort of the genealogy. Right. Well, I, I, I want to start by putting your book into context. Uh, yours is the third I've read this year alone. Uh, Megan Phelps Roper's book, Unfollow, and Tara Westover's book, Educated, which I know you've read. Both of those, um, is this a trend in, 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 in a sense? Uh, one, it's acceptable to do what you've done. Uh, uh, the, the, the acceptance of your courage to come out and, and, and talk about your personal journey and all that. But also, more telling to me, these are all published by trade houses, major New York trade houses, yeah. who are in business to make money. That tells me there's a market for these kinds of stories, whereas perhaps there wasn't before. So I, I'm wondering, is this the rise of the nuns and the, and the increase in secularity and people are hungry for these kinds of of escaping the faith journeys. I think that could be possible. I think that, you know, when the book about Scientology came out going clear, that to me was one of the first, even though it wasn't a memoir, it was kind of one of the first books that investigated on such a personal level, the personal stories of people who had escaped fundamentalist religion. And of course that went on to become a very popular documentary. <laughs> um, but you know, it's funny. I, I don't, I wonder if it's coincidence because Tara Westover's book came out right when my I was finishing mine. And you know, there's always like a year before, after you finish right, the book. So, right. And same with Megan, she was writing hers as right when mine came out. So it also might be coincidental, but I do find that in talking to people that more and more people of my own generation and, you know, others, um, many of us were raised in religion, some of them more extreme, obviously, than others. But there's more and more this sense of people who had been raised around religion or their parents taught them a certain form of faith growing up and finding that it just doesn't work for them in their life. And I don't know anyone you know, of my contemporaries that still is you know, a really faithful churchgoer. So I think people... People who I've spoken to have said that even though the Jehovah's Witnesses or you know Mormons are one one religion, they relate to the story because there's this sense of navigating life without these answers, and also in having felt like some of the answers that you were fed as a child turned out to be false, and the sort of remaking of yourself that you have to do as an adult when you come to grips with that. Yeah, I want to get into the psychology of deconversion because there's theories about this in the psychology of religion, which I think your story matches pretty well. Um, but 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 what I'm after here, I think, is just this idea that uh, stories like yours makes it okay. It's sort of social approval for those who are maybe uh, doubting or not sure or wondering and and are afraid. Just like I don't know, can I can I do this? And then they read your story and it's like I can do this. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of a social um, acceptance or social approval of a behavior that would otherwise be um, not not approved. Yeah, I think that's the case. And given the response I've received to my book, just in the overwhelming amount of emails and messages, um, I think a lot of people did feel that there was this this sort of dearth of stories like this. And yet so many people have been through this, leaving a religion, especially a fundamentalist religion, and going out and feeling like, am I the only one? Like here I am, this apostate, you know, this Satan of sorts that I've been considered by my old community, um, only to find that actually there's many, many people who have had this experience and gone through the same thing. And just uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was invited to speak at a post-Mormon conference oh. with 1,700 post-Mormons in Salt Lake City. 1,700? Yeah. And it was an incredible experience because sitting in the audience, I was the only non-post-Mormon, as they called me, the only Gentile there. <laughs> And the, even though some of the terminology I didn't understand, because each of these groups will have their own terminology, yeah. the greater themes, and I, I could even surmise what the term, terminology meant, because 
the underpinnings of these groups are so similar. And when people leave the experience and what you go through and the trauma and the sort of recalibration of your thinking is exactly the same. So it is something to see a story in print or to watch a story uh, and see yourself in it. It can be, you know, something that's very healing and very empowering. So you were invited because uh, it shows that Mormons aren't the only ones that leave their religion, that this is actually acceptable in other religions too? Yeah, and also just that the parallels, even though a religion could mm. have such different beliefs, Mormon and Jehovah's Witnesses' beliefs do not overlap much right. at all. Right. But it's, it's a really... Um, helpful thing because you know there's a lot of fear involved in leaving a religion like this there's a lot of disorientation um there's a lot of deprogramming because you've been taught that you have the only true religion and so sometimes it's scary to investigate that with ex-members of your own faith because we're taught to fear those people but if someone of a mormon faith tells me about their experience or i read their book it's not as threatening to me and then i see myself in it and then i feel like the com the confirmation that what I suspected to be true about my own religion was in fact true. And that was really the case at the, the Mormon conference with everyone that I spoke to is that we just had these parallels that helped us like feel stronger and that we had, you know, made the right decision despite all the fear and loss that comes with that decision. And were these um, regular Mormons or fundamentalist Mormons? You know, the polygamous yeah, I mean, Mormons? I, I think most of them were mainstream Mormons. The conference was held a block away from the main Mormon temple in Salt Lake City. Yeah, so it was it was really fascinating. And in fact, I went and walked around the temple grounds um, just as an sort of to see how that went. And I got approached by, of course, when you walk in there, the missionaries yeah, kind yeah. of approach you. All of these things are very fun as an ex Jehovah's Witness because you know Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, we would probably call each other like nemeses when we were when we were right. you know both out preaching we would see each other <laughs> you're a cult no you're a cult <laughs> yeah, exactly and so it was actually kind of fun to be there and with all these post-mormon people and, and we would i mean it's it makes for good fodder for laughing about yourselves your they're, former selves they're called foremans former mormons i'm told <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> my friend brian dalton the filmmaker you know he's mr deity he has that series mr deity it's pretty funny he's a former mormon so he's got great stories about this and yeah yeah the ones, the, the uh, polygamous ones um, that live up on the border of Colorado and Arizona in those tiny little towns uh, like near Cayenta and some of those places really off the beaten path. And they pretty much control the entire town. I mean, yeah. everybody there. Uh, I've gone through some of these places and it's kind of spooky. It's like driving through a a Twilight Zone episode or, or a Black Mirror episode and and the people look at you kind of funny and they have the weird dresses and all that stuff. I, I, I feel sorry more for them because they really have no way to get out short of just somebody rescuing them. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so as opposed to sort of regular Mormons, you know, they can come and go. It's much easier. Not not yeah. as much to lose. I, that's part of the, the problem of, of deconversion that you went through is there's a lot to lose. In, in your case, you had you know very few lifelines there to to turn to. But but before we get into that, just just the um, the logistics of writing memoir. I'm curious. Um, did you have to like get permission from everybody you wrote about? Like, is it okay if I tell everybody we had sex, Bob, or whatever you know? Uh, and and I noticed that you know two of the guys were named, but your husband was not named, right? Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, a lot of the names were changed um, oh, okay. just because of the very sensitive nature of the book. Uh, no one who is anyone from my former Jehovah's Witness life speaks to me. So even if I asked them, they would not talk to me because I'm considered an apostate for having left. And on top of leaving to write this book is about the worst crime you can commit as a former Jehovah's Witness. So they really keep their distance from me. I think with my husband, it was interesting. And it, it was something that I really struggled with, which a lot of people who write memoirs struggle with, which is, you, you know, you don't want to reveal so much just like gratuitously that you hurt people or embarrass people. But then you have to walk this fine line where you reveal enough that it's, you know, you have to be true to the story, essentially. So um, I think maybe that was part of why I never used his name. I just called him my husband. But also it was because the relationship for me, which is it's crazy, but it was a marriage of nine years, but it wasn't a very emotionally significant relationship for me because it, you know, as a Jehovah's Witness, you get married young um, because you're not allowed to have sex unless you get married. And my husband and I quickly realized, I think that we 
didn't really belong together. We were only in our early 20s when we got married. Uh, but we couldn't separate because you're not allowed to get divorced. So in the end, maybe that was part of it. But I think part of it was that I, I knew how much he would be so angry that he was in the book that there was probably some part of me that was like, well, I have to put you in, but at least I can keep your name out. <laughs> I'll give you that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because in your TED Talk, you mentioned that he he saw you at some event and, and he's not allowed to talk to you, but he texted you as if that was somehow yeah. different. <laughs> That's a pretty funny story. But the first guy, um, the your first um, lover, Jonathan, I think, before your husband, and then the guy in L.A. No, I'm oh, mixing them John. up. Thomas and, and John. Thomas and oh. John. Those are their real names? And, and you talked to them and said, is it all right if I write about this? Uh, Thomas is not his real name, oh. but I did. The one person in the book who I still do have contact with is the Jonathan character who was the one that helped me to ultimately deprogram. Uh, and I asked him and he was okay with me using his real name. So, but, so you're still friends with him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we talk all the time. Oh, nice. And, yeah. he f and he feels pretty good that you're no longer a witness, obviously, because he, he's the one who kind of deprogrammed you. Yeah. And he, I gave him the book to read when I came right before it came out. And I was a little nervous because there's, there's some parts in there that I think he might not come out looking, you know, like the hero, although in some ways he was a hero. Well, kind of, uh, yeah. In some ways. I mean, it, it, he definitely helped me to get out. Um, but, you, you know, he's a writer himself. And so he understands. And he said, you know, he loved the book. And I think he was quite proud, actually. And I think that he sort of really like owned it and he shared it even with his mother who wrote me a thank you note. It was, it was uh, quite sweet, but um, yeah, I think, I think that like, you know, all of us, when we have this life and we want to make an impact and not all of us can really have such a clear impact that they've made as this one that Jonathan did with me and that he literally changed my life. Like he did literally kind of, help me to get my life back, which is pretty, a pretty big thing to do for someone. And it took a lot of patience, which is not something I don't think everyone would have. Yeah. What was the time frame? I forget, maybe a year or so of, of communicating before you even met him in person. <laughs> so you're in Shanghai, yeah. he's in LA and you're, you're emailing or whatever it is, in, in Instagramming or texting or whatever you're doing. I think it was in chat. Yeah. yeah no it's, it's a chat. That's right. Yeah, that's right. It's a chat. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, um, you know, so he's kind of just asking questions a little bit like Columbo. I just have this one little niggling question here about this one little thing. And that sort of plants that seed of doubt in a way, I think. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I've met Megan Phelps Roper, uh, since my book came out, I happened to be giving a talk in the city that she was also in for a book, um, talk. And we, it was interesting listening to her speak because her, you know, what got her up was very similar. It was over Twitter and she started to interact with someone who was not of her faith in order to convert them um, or to at least sort of advertise the rightness of her belief system. And in the end, you know, people started to argue with her and, you know, she's a very controversial figure at that time because they, you know, that group would say very hate filled, extreme things. Yeah. And in the end, she talks about this in that this ability to actually like reason someone out of their belief system, it is possible. There is a way there's almost, you know, it won't work all of the time, but there is a formula. And one big part of that formula is patience because a person who believes as strongly as she did, or I did that they have the truth is not going to be easily unconvinced. But what happens is that eventually, eventually enough gets through that there will be maybe one thing or two things that will hit you in a way that you can't help but see them. And it's funny because I think for every person that will be different. Mm. Um, for her, it was one thing. For me, it was something different in my religion. But once I saw that one thing, then it was like I could see everything. So it takes this, as you say, asking questions, trying to show inconsistencies. Ultimately, like a belief can be, you can reason your way out of a belief. And I think that's what happened to me in the end is that although I have been taught circular reasoning, I had this emotional attachment, I, I didn't really even know how to think critically at all. Reasoning did get through patient, like simple reasoning. Yeah. I like that. The patience part. I think most of us that are in the business of uh, doing debates and intellectual arguments and this kind of thing, we have this idea, well, if I just write this one killer 
article with the six reasons why climate science is true or evolution is real or whatever, then that'll turn it around. But, you know, as you show, it takes months, years even in some cases to really bring somebody around. You may never even see it if you're a writer. There may be just people out there reading it and they have a change of heart, but six months later or a year later, and you don't even know. Yeah, it's true. And also, as Megan said, it was like, uh, the person who helped deconvince her, and in my case too, was uh, a person who researched. They researched the belief system of the person that they were trying to reason with. So it wasn't just like, you know, all these points are so self-evident. Of course, they're going to see. No, I would have all these mechanisms of defense. And I'm sure it's the same with people who deny climate change. They, you know, they have their things worked out. Um, but when you start to sort of like go over and try to understand the way the person thinks and start from that standpoint, that is where it's a lot easier to start to get someone to come around. Yeah. Um, in those conversations, I'm, I was just curious about this, uh, listening to your book, uh, you hadn't been in love with your husband in a long time. So there was maybe a mix of some of different kinds of emotions in uh, talking to uh, Jonathan all, all that time. Not just, it, it clearly it wasn't just an intellectual exercise. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's an interesting point because, all of this stuff is so hard to pick apart after the fact, but in the end, I did have feelings for him for sure. And that made me more willing to listen, I think, rather than just cut the tie. Because what I had done in past is that if anyone challenged my belief, it's very easy if you don't have an emotional tie to anyone on the outside, which I didn't. I only had emotional ties to people who were in the religion. If someone outside the religion challenged me, I just cut them off, you know, mm. or someone who was even a former member, we were taught just cut them off. Right. So that was what I had done. And this, because this relationship started online, it was, it was almost like, and it was a work relationship to begin with. It was like a backdoor. And interestingly, I, I came across years later, I was trying to understand the mechanisms behind this kind of like indoctrination or brainwashing or whatever you want to call it. You know, I'm a person with the same brain now that I had then. And I, I would think, you know, how did I believe something that to me now I can see is, so obviously not true. And one thing that one expert, she wrote a book uh, called like Love, Terror and Brainwashing. Her name's Alexandra Stein. She wrote about how there are some people who can reason themselves out of a totalist belief system or a cult type belief system. But most often the way someone gets out is through an intimate relationship with someone who isn't a member um, because you're willing to let your guard down in a way that you wouldn't with someone else. Right. So it's a, it's a funny irony, you know, like it's, it's kind of, um, you know, it's like sort of embarrassing to be like, oh, I fell in love and that got me out. Um, but in the end, it sometimes is the only way. And I think that for me, it was certainly at least like half of the factors were that. The other half was that, as if you read the book, you'll find out I was in mainland China, which I think right. was a huge right. contributor. And if I had never gone to China, I definitely would have never left my religion. Yeah, it's interesting, um, that sort of hindsight bias of looking back at the way lives turn out your own, and you kind of construct a plausible causal pathway and think, well, if you know, I went to this college instead of that college, or I met this person, or I took that job instead of that job, and, and that's why I ended up where I did. And, and, and we tend to do that in a way that makes it seem like it was inevitable that I would end up you know, marrying you and have this child and whatever. Uh, but in fact, had you gone left instead of right, or this one and this and, one, and you, you you would have an equally plausible pathway and say, look, it just turned out so amazing that all these things happened. And, and so as a memoirist, you have to kind of think, you know, there's so much randomness and chance involved in all this. Yeah. And I, mean, I think that's one of the most exciting things about life. And also one of the most terrifying things about life is that so much is as a result of chance. And there's so much that we don't have control over. Uh, and life unfolds in front of us with the different choices that we make. Um, even myself, I mean, I was born into a Jehovah's Witness family. I was third generation. I remember oftentimes saying, you know, here and there over the years, I would say, you know, it's such a good thing that I was born into this religion. Because if Jehovah's Witnesses ever came to my door, I would be like, <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> I know all those arguments. <laughs> yeah. So I felt this sense of gratitude that, oh, thank God I was saved through this means, but never really thought about the fact of like, well, why would I have not accepted it? You know, we were taught, you know, in these religions, you're taught, well, your heart condition is the heart that's, a, you know, God called you essentially. And, you know, a lot of the, the narratives don't 
don't add up. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's, I think about often even going backwards, just how different my life would have been if I had left sooner or if I hadn't been born into it. Of course, who knows what I would have done, but I certainly wouldn't have written a memoir about, (laughs) I wouldn't have gone to China and learned Mandarin. So I always try to think of it that way. So uh, just for our listeners who are not that familiar with Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, give us a a quick little rundown of how they differ, say, from Baptists, Protestants, Catholics, whatever. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, they started around the time that Mormons did in the Second Great Awakening, so like the mid to late 1800s. And they're a descendant of the Miller, like there was a guy named Miller. Miller Millerites, yeah. So they were all like the, and Seventh-day Adventists came from that line too. They're all uh, like, Jehovah's Witnesses are apocalyptic. They believe that we're living in the last days. They believe that since their inception. Um, they take a very literal translation of the Bible and a very, very fundamentalist kind of viewpoint of like, we are the saved and everyone else is wrong. So what that involves is that they uh, pull out, you know, from different scriptures, as we know, the Bible has all kinds of crazy things in it. Um, and some of the crazy stuff they ignore, but, you know, over the years, as the doctrine formed, they pulled out different things and felt they were significant and interpreted them, interpreted them literally. So one of those things would be uh, the no blood transfusion rule. You know, there's some Old Testament laws that made this requirement of the Jews. And so they believe that still applies today for different reasons. Um, they don't celebrate Christmas, although they are Christian, because they believe that they're own Christianity is unadulterated by any pagan traditions. And, you know, as we know, Christmas has a lot of pagan traditions involved. Um, Now I love it, but (laughs) at the time, not allowed. Um, They do believe that like a chosen number of people will go to heaven, but they believe that after this apocalypse Armageddon comes, that the vast majority of people who are saved by God will live forever in paradise on earth. And those saved are only Jehovah's Witnesses, no one else. Right. And you were born and raised in Vancouver, which is a beautiful cosmopolitan city. Uh, how did you go from there to Shanghai, China? Well, what happened was, as I, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses aren't allowed to go to college. We're taught because the world is ending that we have to use all of our time to preach. So most Jehovah's Witnesses, we support ourselves with a part-time job, uh, don't really plan for the future because we don't think there will be a future in this world. Right. So I was in Vancouver and spending all my time, you know, most of my time preaching. But, you know, as anyone who is a North American knows, and mo- you know, Jehovah's Witnesses don't get much response when they come to the door. <laughs> no. I mean, you know what you do. <laughs> yeah. So it was, you know, it was tedious and I wanted to do more. And in my territory, there were a lot of immigrants from China. And so the Jehovah's Witness organization had been encouraging people for a while to learn a new language, try to open up new territories to preach so they could convert people of other countries since there wasn't much conversion going on with local people. So um, as I started to learn Chinese, I thought, well, this language is so hard. I will never be able to learn this until I get into the environment. And so I convinced, it took a lot of convincing, but I convinced my husband to move to Taiwan to learn Mandarin with the goal of eventually going to China to preach. China, most people probably realize that religions like mine, uh, my old religion, Jehovah's Witnesses are illegal. Uh, You can't proselytize openly. So going to China, you know, in a way, it's kind of this exciting frontier for a Jehovah's Witness who, especially as a woman, you don't get to do very much other than this sort of mundane routine of waiting for Armageddon to come. Going to China was an exciting proposition. And of course, I was a true believer. So I wanted to give the Chinese people a chance to be saved. That was my thinking at the time. You were 20 something, early 20s? By the time I got to China, no, it was later. It was more, uh, I went to Taiwan when I was around 26, I think, 27. Mm. That's a pretty gutsy thing to do. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's not like going to France or something where, you know, it's, it's, it's very Western. That's particularly since it's illegal what you were doing. So I suspect you have a fairly high openness to experience on the, you know, the, the big five personality dimensions, uh, higher risk taking, which makes you more open to changing your mind about the even these deep seated beliefs like that. I, I was just thinking about your personality when I was reading your book, because <laughs> uh, like when I moved to China, I mean, I can barely get through Spanish in California, which is pretty bad. I mean, I've looked I've, I've seen Mandarin it's like it just. Might as well be an extraterrestrial language. Really hard. Yeah, but you have to understand too, though, the mindset of the fundamentalist. Like, 
there is no person you read these articles of people who travel to was it recently like last year there was some preacher who went to this island and got killed by the right. local i mean right. when you believe you have god on your side you're not afraid of anything and I, in china i wasn't afraid like even if i had to go to jail i you know your mindset is well i'm doing it for jehovah you know and that if i suffer persecution well then i'm doing a good thing and it you know it's even better for me right. so that said, in China, a Westerner doesn't face that much risk. Like okay. if I got caught, probably they would just deport me. In fact, that's what they would do in this day and age. But, you know, it, this mindset you have when you're out to convert other people, it's, you know, it's I always compare it to you almost have the mindset of a suicide bomber, like you would die for it. And if somebody told you you had to die for it, you would, because that's how fully you believe it. So I do think that, yes, I definitely like adventure. And I think that that's probably some latent thing in me that made it that I could get out of the religion too, that there was some openness, even though I was so fully indoctrinated. Um, but too, it was this zeal for, you know, wanting to convert that really drove me a, a large part of it. Yeah. Even moving to New York City uh, toward the end of your book, you talk yeah. about you, you have almost no money. That's a pretty gutsy thing to do. That's an expensive <laughs> yeah. city. I think that that was probably more gutsy than moving to China, to be honest. <laughs> but it was more na being naive, I think. <laughs> All right. So just uh, w walk us through one of these uh, witnesses. You, you knock on the door. They open the door. Hi, I am, I'm Amber. I'm here with the Jehovah Witnesses. You know, I, I, they've come to my door. I know they have the literature and all that stuff. What, what's the strategy? Do they, do they teach you how to do it? Do they give you a little three-ring binder and go, this is how we witness for the Lord or whatever? Oh, well, it starts from literally the time you can read as children. If you're raised in the religion, we have meetings three times a week. Um, one of those meetings is expressly for the purpose of training you how to preach and conduct Bible studies with people. Um, the, your whole life from the very young age, you know, I remember going out, we call it going out in service, going out preaching. And, you know, you're encouraged as a young one to start by giving out the tract and, you know, that you're sort of raised up in it and trained how to do it. That said, you don't get very far. So you don't, you know, it, it, it doesn't take a lot of skill to go knock on doors. You know, if you got further to the point where somebody would accept a Bible study, we had publications that were presented so simply, just questions and answers from the paragraphs that, you know, it's almost like looking at it now, it's almost like mind numbingly simple. Right. Um, but to us, we, were, we felt, well, the truth should be simple, you know, like everything should add up in this very clear way. And so we would use those publications to go through and teach people. I think a large part of any convertees that we ever found were that, you know, the doctrines were one thing and different things would appeal to different people. But there was also this community that gets, you know, they embrace you with love and slowly you don't really realize that you're getting into a very controlling religion it takes a long time mm. before that ever you ever realize that in fact you might never realize it if you never go off the rails like as long as you're doing what you're told you don't feel like you're being coerced you're just you're just complying right it's until you start to there's some sort of like discord or something starts to not add up or something happens in your life that doesn't work with what the religion says that's when you start to see the dark side of it. Yeah. Yeah, I sent you the story from the believing brain of uh, when I became a born-again Christian in high school, mainly at the urging of my friend George. Uh, they were Presbyterian. Uh, and so I finally went to the Presbyterian Church in Glendale, California, and and, and I went up to the, you know, they did the calling forward at the end of the sermon and, you know, you, you get blessed or whatever. And so I did it and I came back and, and my friend Frank at high school had been also talking to me about, Jesus and religion and so on. I didn't know anything about any of these religions. And when I told him, I said, Frank, I became a Christian. I went to the Presbyterians. And he's like, no, that's the wrong one. I'm like, wrong one? What do you mean? I'm a Jehovah Witness. They're, we're the right ones. I'm like, oh, okay. And that, that was always in the back of my mind. Like, so there's a right one and a wrong one, but don't you have these core beliefs? And doesn't that matter? What? Yeah. So if you knocked on a door and someone said, hey, I'm Catholic already. I accept Jesus. I'm going to heaven what would you say? Well, we had this whole book called the reasoning book where we would have objections like that, that the, our, the people that write the publications for the witnesses are the leaders in New York. They had made this whole book that gave responses. So I think we would, 
you know, with Catholic or something, we would try to find common ground. It's fine because I'm really having to like go back to my old <laughs> former self to remember what I would say. Uh, sorry. There was a lot of times like, where we would try to sort of say, you know, sort of put aside the difference. We say like, oh, well, as a Catholic, you also want to have a happy family life. And, you know, you also probably accept that the Bible is the way to find that. So why don't we look at the Bible? And, you know, we always had our own secret prejudices where we're like, oh, the Catholics, they don't know their Bibles or like, (laughs) oh, the Jews, you'll never convert one of them. (laughs) You know, it's like all of these like internal uh, Jehovah's Witness politics. Um, But ultimately, uh, we didn't get far. I mean, even in China. It was, you got farther because people didn't know what Jehovah's Witnesses were. And they had, young people especially had a real interest in the Bible because they had been cut off from that education, you know, religious education. They had never had a chance to learn about it. And now that things were getting more free in China, a lot of, a lot of people were interested and they were also just interested in having foreign friends. So we got a lot farther, funnily enough, in a country that had no religion essentially than i ever did at home do you think the the elders as they're called or somebody in the church has any data on conversion rates how effective is it they do every year they publish sort of generalized numbers per country of how much the growth was how many people got baptized what they don't publish is how many people left or how many people died so it's a little hard to tell you know, what the actual numbers mean. But overall, Jehovah's Witnesses have seen, because they're such a vigorous proselytizer, much like Mormons, they do see growth. Not so much in North America or Europe anymore, though. The growth that they see now is mostly in places like Asia or in South America. I think you quoted 8 million followers of yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses. About that. You no. think that's accurate? You know, Scientology is always saying, you know, we have 10 million or whatever. And people like Leah Remini who are in the church, they say that's a bunch of baloney. It's more like 50,000 or 100,000. Actually, with witnesses, I think it's true because the the number they base that on is that when you're a Jehovah's Witness, you have to turn in a report every month saying how many hours you preached. And for that number, they only count the number of people that actually preached because if you don't preach, you're not a real mm-hmm. witness. So I think it's probably pretty accurate. I do see them everywhere. I travel a fair amount. And yes, my, wife, my wife's from Germany, and so we go there every year. I see them everywhere. Every German city, they're there. You, know, you can spot them, you know, 100 meters away with their little stand yeah. with the little booklets, and they have them in 10 languages. And it's, yeah. And they're the nicest people. You know, even in Santa Barbara, a few months ago, they came by my, my house. And it's nicest ladies. And, you know, I, yeah, they're so I, nice. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I try to talk to them. And. I give them a copy of Skeptic Magazine, which <laughs> they're like, uh-oh. <laughs> sure, time, they just threw it away. <laughs> t- time to call in the elders. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, nice people. And um, this is the thing. is like, by no means am I someone who's like vilifying Jehovah's Witnesses by writing my book or, you know, talking about this stuff openly. But if anything, it's, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses are very uh, cut off from the real world in many ways. They're not allowed to read things that are by former believers. So they're kind of living in this uh, intellectual bubble or, you know, belief bubble. Um, But I always feel great compassion for that because I remember how that felt. And when you're on the inside, you don't know any different. You think that that's the best life because you're told that. Um, and, you know, even the things that you do with your time, all this preaching, I mean, that takes a lot of self-sacrifice and you, it takes a lot of caring for other people because you think that you're going to save their life. Of course, now that I'm out of it, I can see, you know, how much more dimensional the world is and how many things get ignored um, that are actual real help that people need beyond being converted to, you know, some fundamentalist religion. Um, but, you know, you mean well and they're good people. Uh, I did it a little bit when I was at Pepperdine University, which is a Church of Christ school. And then a little bit after that, you know, going door to door. I never really liked it. It was always a little anxiety producing for me. It's like, ooh. No, I don't like it either. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, I know what they're going to be thinking. And, you know, but I would do the whole thing and, you know, tell them, you know, I, you know, uh, you know, we, Jesus loves you. I love you. You know, the afterlife, the whole thing. But, you know, when you're 20 or in your early 20s, what the hell do you know about life? You know, if you encounter yeah. somebody with real world real life problems, you know, so what are the answers to like, what's the meaning of life or, you know, what happens after we die? You know, these are the kinds of things that that they they ask and then they have answers. So what would you answer to somebody? You know, you say, okay, don't you want to live forever? What's the afterlife or what's the meaning of life? What's the paragraph for those kinds of questions? 
Well, Jehovah's Witnesses have this whole doctrine worked out as to why God allows suffering. And it all has to do with, you know, Adam and Eve and the sin and that the redemption and that God only allows suffering temporarily to kind of prove a point that Satan was wrong. Um, and basically their their whole thrust is to say that this life is not the real life, um, you know, that humans were intended to live forever. The earth was created for human beings to live forever on uh, and that this sort of wrench got thrown in the plan by Adam and Eve's sin. So their, their whole thrust is to say that this life um, is not the real life and that if you convert to being a Jehovah's Witness, all of the suffering and the things that you endured in this current life will not matter anymore because you'll have endless millions of years of perfect health and happiness. Um, so we always did try to focus people's attention on that earthly paradise um, as something to comfort people. And then the other angle I see the Jehovah's Witnesses taking a lot these days when I walk by their carts is sort of like de-emphasizing this aspect of their religion, which is all about conversion or, you know, us and them, the sheep and the goats, the judgmental side of it. And they're sort of promoting their magazines and the Bible as something where you can gain practical help. And I've seen a lot of interviews in the media where the witnesses now kind of spin it and say like, oh, we just want to, we've derived so much help from the Bible that we just want to help others to derive that same help. And of course, on some level, that's true. There's very good principles in the Bible that can help your life, but it is not what it means to be a Jehovah's Witness, to just get a little bit of, you know, self-help. It's, it's much, it goes much deeper than that. Yeah. And, but can, you draw people in with that message and then slowly you get to the other stuff. I forget, do wit witnesses believe you are physically resurrected or is it your soul yeah. that goes to heaven? Physically. like Your, your actual body. He creates you, yeah, essentially. How old? <laughs> well, you know, there's like endless articles about this in the Watchtower. Yeah. I think they say, oh, at the age that you die, but then, you know, in paradise, people who make it through Armageddon and are elderly are going to slowly get younger again. I mean, you know, the problem is you create a doctrine like this and then there's so many logistics that you have to explain. Right, right. <laughs> so because Armageddon hasn't come yet, the Jehovah's Witnesses year by year, I think they keep on explaining more. They just come up with the answers to satisfy these questions, you know. Well, I mean, it's, you know, inquiring minds want to know. I forget which sect it was that said 30, because that's the age Jesus was when he was crucified. Right. Uh, and, and also 30 is kind of the perfect uh, age for physical strength and memory and vitality and all that stuff. Well, yeah, of course, it's all a bunch of uh, nonsense, because... I mean, Julia Sweeney has a great monologue. I don't know if you know Julia Sweeney from Saturday Night Live. So then she she is now a monologuist, so her monologue is letting go of God. Yeah. And so she talks about converting from Catholicism to secularism, atheism, whatever. And uh, so she, she tells a story about the Mormon boys coming by her house in Hollywood, and it's just hilarious where they're pitching their story. And, and uh, you know, she's like, what, Jesus? Wait, Jesus came to America? What? In 600 BC? Anyway, just crazy stuff. But then she talks about, uh, so they, they say, well, you know, uh, I was, she has a little bit of background about her family and how, how difficult her growing up with her family was. And that the Mormon boys say, well, when you die and go to heaven, you get to spend eternity with your family. And she's like, oh, <laughs> uh, that would not be good for me. And uh, then they go, <laughs> and then they say, so, and in heaven, you're made whole again. The blind shall see, the deaf shall hear, and the handicapped shall be made whole again. And she said, well. I had cancer of my uterus, so I don't have a uterus anymore. Do I get my uterus back? <laughs> Picture these 18-year-old boys going, what's the uterus again? <laughs> so they go, yes. She goes, I don't want it back. And they go like, oh, no. And then she says, what if you had a nose job and you liked it? Do I have to have my own nose job back in my own nose in heaven? I mean, it's crazy when you start just kind of drilling down into these things. And that's uh, the thing. Like, you have to create more stories to explain the other stories. And, and this, you know, you mentioned a million years. That's nothing. Eternity. A trillion years. Tr trillion, trillion years. Uh, and what are you doing when you're there, particularly if you're physically resurrected? I had a college professor who wanted to know if there were tennis courts in heaven when I was preaching to him. I'm like, what? He goes, I need challenges. I don't want to just sit there and, <laughs> you know, in bliss because it's Sounds boring. boring. <laughs> totally boring. Christopher Hitchens famously described the Christian heaven as celestial North Korea. You know, you have this dictator that knows everything you're thinking and controls everything you do. Blech. Yeah. 
No, it doesn't sound fun. It, yeah, it's funny. And, and kind of similar to that was one of that was one of the things that really started to make me kind of maybe start to form some cracks in my faith in China was one of those things like following the logic through, which I would have never been confronted with if I had stayed in Canada. But in China, I was, you know, by the time I could speak Mandarin and I started to understand like Chinese people are so hospitable and they also have a real cultural um, respect and reverence for teachers. So in the beginning, a Chinese student would never challenge me. In fact, ever. They never would challenge you on something you were teaching them. But as I got to know the language more, you know, and the culture more, I started to see things like through intuition a little more and understand what they were thinking. You know, it didn't take everything at the face value you do when you don't understand a language or a culture. And one of the things that started to really bother me was I noticed when I would teach them this stuff, which so much of it is based in Western culture and in this conception of, you know, even if even if you or I are not religious, we have this religious basis, this tradition in our culture that we understand this I, this story of Adam and Eve. We, you know, we, we understand what, you know, Jesus story, these types of things. Um, but in China, this stuff was just so foreign and bizarre to them. And I could see how there was very low chance that any of my students were going to actually start mm. to believe in this. Mm. And then I started to think about how there's like 1.3 billion people in China. And God always said that basically it was an even playing field that even, you know, no matter what country you were born into, if you were really God's person, like if you were really a, the person with the right heart to live forever in paradise, that, you know, God would find you. We Jehovah's Witnesses would find you. And I thought that this is not a level playing field. Like, mm. you know, if, if you're gonna say like 1.3 billion people, how many people are going to actually convert here? Because they have a completely different way of looking at life. They have their own very highly developed culture, wisdom. We're talking like Confucius, right. just as wise as the Bible but completely different origins. And so I just started to feel like, why would God make it that I am just born into it? So I get to be saved. And right. yet 1.3 billion people are looking at me like, are you crazy when they hear it? And that was something that just started to bug me. Cause I thought that doesn't add up that there's this God who's so just yet. There's going to be like 10 Chinese people in paradise and like 500,000 <laughs> white people, you know? Right. right. What, so what, 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 what about people that you can't witness to, like, you know, pa Papua New Guineans out in the highlands, yeah. you can't even get to them? Like Muslims, we don't, we can't witness in Muslim countries. Yeah, yeah. what happens to them when, when the end comes? We just didn't concern ourselves. Okay. <laughs> you know? When you're in a religion like this, you just have blind and you just, you be, you'd be confronted with something and you'd be like, well, you know, God will figure it out. So like, and that's yeah. what I mean by being in China is that because I was for the first time confronted with it and my own sort of elitist attitude and you know the rest of it that was when i had to think about it but you know if right. you don't confront that if you're not in the face of it personally it's yeah. easy to just sort of be like oh well god will figure that out you know right here's what i wrote about the jehovah witnesses in my book uh, how we believe the jehovah witnesses must hold the record for the most failed dates of doom including mm -hmm. 1874, 1878, 1881, 1910, 1914, 1918, 1920, 1925, and others all the way up to 1975. One of the most novel and audacious rationalizations for failed prophecy came after Armageddon's non-arrival in 1975. Yeah. In a 1966 book published by the Watchtower Society, Life Everlasting in Freedom of the Sons of God, that's quite a title. The witnesses established the date of creation at 4,026 B.C., declaring that 6,000 years from man's creation will end in 1975, and the seventh period of 1,000 years of human history will begin in the fall of 1975. The Watchtower Society's president, Frederick Franz, at a Toronto, Ontario rally, blamed the members themselves because Jesus had stated that no man will know the day or hour of his coming. The witnesses jinxed the second coming. He said, quote, do you know why nothing happened in 1975? It was because you expected something to happen. <laughs> I never heard that quote. That's yeah. great. Undaunted, they recalibrated again, citing October 2nd, 1984 as doomsday. Finally, in 1996, the leaders of the church learned the Millerite lesson. I was writing about, about Miller and his predictions. Yeah. 
In the November 1996 issue of Awake, members discovered that, quote, the generation that saw the events of 1914 would not, after all, be seeing the end of the world. Instead, this oft-quoted line was replaced by a much vaguer, quote, is about to clause, reducing dissonance indefinitely. And then I have a list of, like, uh, rationalizations for failed uh, doomsdays. The prophecy was fulfilled spiritually. The prophecy was fulfilled physically, but not as expected. The date was miscalculated. The date was a loose prediction, not a specific prophecy. The date was a warning, not a prophecy. And God changed his mind in order to be merciful, and then predictions were just a test of your faith. <laughs> you, must have, you must have gone through some of those rationalizations. Well, I, was, I mean, I wasn't born then in the 19th, the, way back then, but the, as the time went on through my life, um, I definitely did because, again, around the turn of the century, like around 2000, they were sort of hinting that it wasn't going to happen, it was, that Armageddon would come by the year 2000, but they never put it so explicitly as they had in the past. And of course it didn't, but, you know, someone has done like research on this and said that actually that sometimes in these religions, when a date fails, people are even more committed to the religion afterwards because they just get more invested or the idea of like admitting they were wrong becomes more scary or real. So I think that's, that's what happens. And it's funny because I just saw online that there's like a watchtower article. They study these watchtowers every Sunday and the one that's coming out imminently a couple of weeks, I think, um, is called something to the effect of like, we're in the last of the last days. <laughs> so they used to also always call it the last days, but now the last the of the last of the, the last of the last days, it's the beginning of the end of the final last, almost certain to be there soon. <laughs> exactly. Like how many more um, adjectives are you going to add? But I, I did notice that it's, it's a, a funny thing. Just the way that you have to keep the this this sense of urgency does help, and you know we have short memories. We don't remember what we don't want to remember. And I remember like even with failed dates, knowing I knew that had happened, but I, I wanted so badly for it to be true. And by this point, you're so invested that you just you would. It scares me honestly because I wonder if the leadership said something really extreme, if people would do it, and I think that they might. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, they haven't gone too extreme, although I think take, saying no to blood transfusions and dying without taking one is extreme. But um, You mean commit violence? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I don't think they will ask that, but the underpinnings of that kind of belief is the same thing that is Jonestown. I mean, this is a continuum, and I'm not saying that Jonestown are going to do that, but their um, videos in recent years, they show at conventions, have become more and more strange. Like they've had some videos in recent years where they show, they depict the Jehovah's Witnesses in a bunker and they showed mm -hmm. some, uh, a, 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 like basically it looks like a SWAT team be beating down the door and holding guns. And I, I think, you know, it's interesting because I read this article in the New Yorker a while back, a few years ago, about David Koresh and the Branch Davidians, who were also from the same family of religions right. as Jehovah's right. Witnesses. And when I read it, obviously, again, that's one that's more extreme, but the underpinnings of what he believed were the same. And when apocalypse didn't come, it was almost like it, it, you could feel this sense that an apocalypse of someone's creation was going to happen and did in that case. And with the witnesses doing this, I'm always like, they didn't, when I was a witness 10 years ago, or 11 years ago, we did not see that kind of propaganda. And now it's, it's a strange thing. Like what are, they'll say it without saying it. It's very vague, but mm -hmm. they sort of intimate that there's going to be some sort of attack on the Jehovah's Witnesses in a violent way. And it just reminds me of the Branch Davidian thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In the case of, of the Waco tragedy, I mean, it's almost like they brought it on themselves. He was definitely hoarding guns and weapons for some reason. Uh, and then there was the child abuse stuff going on. So, you know, th there was some reason uh, for going in there. But the way the government handled it was so bad, it brought about pretty much what they were predicting, which is very unfortunate. It's still not clear, as far as I know, who started those fires. If yeah. if he, he if he if he launched it himself, is like this is the final Gotter Damarong, and we're gonna we're gonna play it out, or if it was just a spark or an accident or something like that, because they were pumping in that gas that was highly volatile that fueled the fire even more. Anyway, that's yeah. kind of a, kind of a. A sidebar, you referenced uh, that study. That's Leon Fessinger's famous cognitive dissonance study. He was a young uh, psychology professor in 1954, and he'd read about a doomsday cult in Chicago uh, that the, 
uh, that the mothership was going to come, these aliens. It was kind of a UFO cult. Uh, they were going to come on December 21st, the winter solstice in 1954. And that, uh, and he noted that members had like sold their belongings and, you know, they, they went up to the local mountaintop or whatever. So he went up there with his clipboard and taking notes like, OK, let's see what happens. And, you know, it's like five minutes to midnight and everybody's, you know, here, you know, looking for the mothership. And, it, you know, now it's 1205 and they're checking their watches and ooh, it's 1230 and people are getting anxious. And so what he wanted to know was, well, like, would they all go home tomorrow and go, well, that was a stupid idea. Let's give up this crazy UFO cult. No, they doubled down on their beliefs and, and worked to convert even more people to justify. And then they did the recalculate. Oh, no, it was next year. We forgot to carry the one or whatever. And uh, <laughs> So he wrote a book about that called When Prophecy Fails, and it's about the psychology of cognitive dissonance. And that led to a whole uh, branch of, of psychological research. Carol Tavris has a beautiful book about this called Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me. <laughs> and it's, it's about rationalization and this, this sort of cognitive dissonance uh, of the more invested you are in a particular belief, even if it's like you, you, you paid for the movie as opposed to going for free, you're going to enjoy the movie more even if it sucks, that kind of stuff. So this gets to the problem of this kind of uh, of deconversion, you know, uh, in the atheist, humanist, secularist community. It's like, how can we get more people to leave religion or something, or become pro science or secularists? And so, like in, in in specific things, like if you give somebody, as I like to say, a choice between Darwin and 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 Jesus, uh, you know, like you're worried about the teaching of evolution or whatever, you know, Darwin's not going to win that one. You know, you, you have to take off the table the religious commitments people have and say, you should accept the science of evolution because it's true. Maybe this is God's way of creating life or something like that. In other words, cognitive dissonance and the wall is going to go up. They're not going to listen to you if you tell them that they, you have, they have to give up right at the, on the spot their deepest held convictions, their moral values, and so on. Uh, and that's that's kind of gets to the core of your story and, you know, and why it took so long you know, it's not like uh, somebody knocks on your door and says, I have a copy of The Origin of Species here and uh, yeah. and, and Skeptic Magazine or whatever. And uh, so you should leave. It's not going to happen. Right. Yeah. And it's that commitment yeah. that, you know, you define yourself by those certain foundational beliefs. Really hard to give up. It's that. I mean, definitely there's that. But there's also, I think, for someone like me, I really wanted it to be true. I wanted to live forever. I wanted, um, you know, my father died. I wanted to see him again. So the proposition of giving up all of that, well, all it takes for me to have all that in my mind is to keep faithful. It's a simple thing. Just stay faithful and you will have all of this. Yeah. So you, you do. And then the other part of it is, is that especially for religions like Jehovah's Witnesses is that they train you to make your life revolve around the community. They constantly, um, tell you not to make any connections that are close on the outside. So you don't have anyone on the outside and you don't even really know how the outside world works. Like you have a job, but you know, you're not part of that culture. So there's that separation too, where you don't even feel like you would fit in anywhere else. And I struggled that with that. Even when I left, like I started to just go out and try to make friends and you know people would go I was in Shanghai still and there was an expat community and so people were pretty open but I would go with them to do the things that they did and maybe we would go to a bar or something and I just felt so weird I didn't know what people did or how they acted and then suddenly <laughs> someone would have drugs or something I'd be like oh my god like you know it was so hard to navigate that stuff um so to me the the thing that made it that, you know, these holes on me were very strong. But ultimately, I think that there is there's something in human beings that even though we can cover it over and suppress it, and it can be like taught out of us, I think we have a deep inner desire to be free and to be able to think and be able to <clears throat> decide like our own have agency in our lives. And so when it came to um, leaving all of that, although that was so much to give up, when I realized that my beliefs were not true, it just, all of the other stuff, all of the sacrifices that would involve, it was not even a decision. I knew that that was going to have to happen because mm -hmm. I couldn't live my life for something. And I knew the moment when, you know, I had started to have doubts. 
I knew the moment when I, you know, a bunch of things had transpired and I thought, okay, I'm all alone in Shanghai. Maybe they do have the truth. Like I was still scared. I still was scared that I was going to die at Armageddon. And I would read about, you know, if you read about climate change, you're like, oh my gosh, like this is how these religions exist is because the world is a scary place. So I remember I went back to the meeting um, that I had gone to my whole life and I had stopped for a while and, you know, been sort of researching and questioning. And when I went back to the meeting, because the pull was so strong and sat there, it was as if I could hear what they were saying for the first time. And it felt bad. Like it just, some of it was good. Not all of it was bad, but some of it was like, this doesn't feel right anymore. Like it doesn't feel true. And then I knew I just couldn't do it. And I think one good thing is that a religion like a very hardcore religion, like Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness Scientology, it requires a lot of commitment. And so when you believe in it, you're willing to make that commitment. But if you don't fully, if you're not all in, it is a very hard life yeah. to live. Yeah. So for myself, as soon as my doubts were sufficient to realize that two of the things I had problems with were things I couldn't live with then it was just a matter of time and slowly deprogramming until I could completely leave it behind. What would you say to somebody who, let's say, was your, maybe a a young woman, late teens, early 20s, that wants to go join ISIS? They've been reading stuff online. They're, they're, They're true believers. They think, you know, Islam is the one true religion and that this particular branch is the right way to go. And that America really is the, you know, the evil Satan that must be destroyed. And we're going to go over there, maybe not just young women, but just young men, anybody that thinks I'm going to do this. Now, apparently you know, very few young women are committing suicide, um, but, but, but still the mindset is, as you said in the book, I would do pretty much anything my religion told me to do. Now, fortunately for you, you weren't in a violent religion for the most part, except for the blood transfusion thing. But, uh, but you know— how do you talk somebody out of that? Let's say somebody in the State Department reads your book and goes, hey, can you help us talk these people yeah. out of going to ISIS? Good job. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's but it's, job. Seri- it's serious. It's scary. I mean, these people yeah. are they, they're true believers. You know, we're just on the cusp of that shooting in Pensacola uh, with this guy, you know, is here to train. And, and then all of a sudden he shoots up his fellow uh, soldiers. He apparently was a true believer. He was watching videos the night before of mass shootings, getting himself all worked up. I mean, what, what well, you're dealing with here is really important. Uh, yeah, for other it areas. Does apply. It applies broadly, especially I think right now. Um, there's two sides to this. Like one side to this is that I understand what it felt like to be that person in a different environment, obviously, but the mindset and. <clears throat> It is really difficult to just, you know, say something that will wake them up because you could say the most obvious thing and they'll still believe what they believe. I mean, that's kind of human beings. Right. Um, but the one thing that, you know, if maybe you could be locked away for a week with the person and like get through to them, develop trust in a relationship. Um, the one thing that really helped me see was that Jonathan, the character in my book, the guy, um, he pointed out to me that he found something, an inconsistency. Like he found that there was something wrong that the Jehovah's Witnesses had gotten wrong and that we all knew was wrong. Say it was a date. I think it might've been one of the dates. And he said, okay, you don't have to, he's like, maybe it's like, you don't have to give up your religion, but just, he's like, put that aside for a second and just think if they're wrong about that, say 1975, what else might they be wrong about? Mm -hmm. And that was, that like opened up some space for me because I couldn't not believe it wasn't true at that time, but to be able to make that maybe like one incremental step that I could acknowledge that like, okay, maybe they're also wrong about the blood transfusions. Um, Maybe they're also wrong about the way they handle child abuse, you know? And really ultimately when I left, it wasn't like, like I just threw everything off at the beginning. I still thought that a lot of it was true, but I, that blood transfusion thing kind of did it for me because I realized they're causing people to die over an erroneous translation or interpretation, sorry, of the Bible. So um, I think that's the thing is to try to not, you can't like always go direct, like head on, be like, how could you believe this? It's ridiculous. Right. But if you can find something that will, you know, create an inconsistency that they can't resolve in their mind, that can be something that leads to 
like a further unraveling or deprogramming. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just telling somebody, you know, if you go over there, you're probably going to die. That probably wouldn't do it because they're thinking, well, so what? I get to go to heaven. I'm a yeah, martyr. You don't care. Yeah. You don't care. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that little sort of crack in the armor. Just so, See, this is one reason why I, I, I've experienced with young earth creationists, why they don't want to give up the, the age of the earth. I mean, what difference does it make how old the earth is, whether you go to heaven or not, whether Jesus loves you or not? But for them, mm-hmm. it does, because if the Bible is wrong about that one little thing right there in Genesis 1-2, and what about Genesis 1-3 and 4 and 5 and the next book and so yeah. on, maybe the whole— So they draw the line pretty early in the sand, and they don't yeah. like any of this, well, metaphorical thinking. It's a, you know, it's a homily. It's a metaphor. It's just a story. It didn't really happen. They don't like to allow that to happen for that very reason. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't, yeah, boy, that's a hard one. Yeah. So, uh, oh, I was going to say back in the 90s, there was a group called the Cult Awareness Network, CAN, that was set up to deprogram Scientologists and, and other cults, but m- mainly that, and they actually got into trouble because they were kidnapping people. Right, I read about that. And taking them into a, like a hotel, like you said, you know, for a week, <laughs> that we're going to deprogram you. And well, it turns out you, you can't actually do that. That's actually illegal. Like human rights. And then they got sued and they got bought. <laughs> they got taken over by Scientology, who kind so of right? yeah, who kind of buried that part of it. And, the, and so they still were, were still advertising Cult Awareness Network. Yeah, we're going to help you get out of bad cults. All the others, because the Scientology right. was, because <laughs> they all think they're the one true religion. Yeah. yeah. That's the other thing I try to do is, to, just, uh, in terms of planting a seed of doubt, is to apply the Copernican principle, which is you're not special. Uh, so, what are the chances I say to Christians that you know you got the one true religion, and you know the yeah. I know there's two billion of you, but there's a billion Muslims, and there aren't that many Jews by comparison. But you know these most Jews are really well-read, educated, smart. They know the arguments for the resurrection, and they don't accept it. Why? Yeah. Why? Because Christians will think, well, if they just heard these three arguments about the resurrection, then they'd accept it. No, yeah. no, no. People know the arguments. They they just don't accept them. They're not that good. So there I yeah. try to plant that little seed of doubt, because Jews and Muslims believe in the same God. Yeah. Even the same, at least the Old Testament book. <laughs> so yeah. you, know, you, you don't have to argue with me, the atheist. You know, you can you argue with your own, with a rabbi. These rabbis are really smart. They know the arguments. Okay. Anyway, that's that's a little point. I think it's helpful though because um, that was something too that did strike me as I started to have doubts. Was just everyone thinks they're right. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what really helped me was that I um, I came across that profile of Paul Haggis in the New Yorker. Yeah, the- yeah, yeah. And I, of course, as a Jehovah's Witness, I always thought, oh, Scientologists—they're the crazy ones and the Mormons, but right, mostly the right, Scientologists. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> but when he described his experience of leaving and what happened to him and how the community reacted, um, it was identical to what I had just gone through because I left the witnesses in around 2007. And um, he, he said at the end of the article, I had been in a cult my entire life and everyone could see it, but me. Yeah. And, and now he could see it. Uh, it's, you know, this is the thing. When I saw that, I thought, okay, if a Scientologist ta- sounds exactly like me, feels exactly like me, and was treated in exactly the same way, it means it's it's no different. And we all think we're right. <laughs> right. In fact, we're just all wrong. <laughs> yeah, you make that point in your TED Talk, that, the point I also make. No one joins a cult. No one's ever joined a cult. They join a group they think is great. I got that line from one of the survivors of Jonestown. There's a great uh, two-hour PBS documentary on on Jonestown, and they interviewed the handful of survivors. And that's the first thing this woman said was no one's joins a cult. And when you yeah. look at the history of Jonestown, well, not, not Jonestown down there, but the, you know, they started in San Francisco, yeah. you, know, you know, Jim Jones was a real civil rights pioneer. I mean, he was, uh, you know, helping the poor and manning the soup kitchens. And he was one of the earliest white churches to have blacks and yeah. elevated women to <laughs> prominent social roles. Justice. Yeah. It's like, this is a good thing. Yeah. And then, you know, 10 years later, it's not such a good thing. But uh, that's the thing. I, a lot of witnesses, you know, they're taught a certain way of reasoning about this stuff. And so if I ever do get a Jehovah's Witness kind of that dares talk to me on social media, will often use this line of reasoning like, oh, how can you say that they're uh, like 
have cult-like tendencies, look how much good they do. I'm like, doing right. good does not preclude you from being a cult. Right, right. I mean, people join them because there's something good in it. Yeah. That's fact. I also want to explore that, that sort of whole end of the world apocalypse theme because it comes up over and over in not just religions. Most religions have some scenario about this. But in political ideology, for example, here's a an excerpt from um, Daniel Chereau and the social psychologist Clark McCauley uh, talking about Marxist eschatology, which actually mimic Christian doctrine. In the beginning, there was a perfect world with no private property, no classes, no exploitation, and no alienation, a Garden of Eden. Then came sin, the discovery of private property, and the creation of exploiters. Humanity was cast from the garden to suffer inequality and want. Humans then experimented with a series of modes of production, from the slave to the feudal to the capitalist mode, always seeking the solution and not finding it. Finally, there came a true prophet with a message of salvation, Karl Marx, who preached the truth of science. He promised redemption, but was not heeded except by his close disciples who carried the truth forward. Eventually, however, the proletariat, the carriers of the true faith, will be converted by the religious elect, the leaders of the party, and joined to create a more perfect world. A final terrible revolution will wipe out capitalism, alienation, exploitation, and inequality. After that, history will end because there will be perfection on earth and true believers will have been saved. That's amazing. <laughs> and look what happened in the 20th century. We're talking about 100 million dead. So there's a logic to genocide in this sense. If you believe that there can be a utopia that can be achieved in which everyone lives forever perfectly happy. How evil are these people over here that are preventing us from achieving utopia? You do the math. You know, yeah. it's like the trolley problem. Would you sacrifice one to save these five? You know, almost everybody goes, yes, I'd flip the trolley switch, you know. So would you kill one million Jews to save five million Germans? Yes, yes, that does seem like a good thing. You know, people just go down this road of ideology and that's, so there's something in the human mind about this sort of end times the world's gonna but we're it's always we're the ones that'll be saved right you know? that, that narrative is just for some reason so appealing i mean even just you can think about nationalism too like i mean you know people think america's exception it's the same thing it, <laughs> it, it is to it's like, totally it's clearly, it's, there's clearly something in human beings that yeah we like being the chosen one it makes us feel good about ourselves to other to other people we like to feel like we're on the right side. And also we like to have a sense of belonging. You know, we like to feel part of something bigger than ourselves, which almost always requires some enemy, you know, that you're fighting. Yeah. Uh, okay. A couple other topics I want to hit from your book, because uh, another one of these themes that comes up a lot in all religions and cults is sex. There seems to be this obsession with controlling female sexuality by religion so you have this scene in your book, which uh, just, here's how I picture it, because you, you describe them yeah. as the elders. So I'm picturing these, you know, three 70-something-year-old guys that haven't been laid in 25 years, and they're grilling some 20-year-old girl about her sexuality, and how long did you touch his penis, and did he climax? And you're going, what? <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, this just sounds crazy. Uh, I mean, how old are these elders, and what, what really is the purpose of this? It is really kind of, I feel, to control female sexuality. Well, it's different in, depending on the congregation because the elders that I confessed to, I was, I think, 19 years old at the time or 18. Um, and they were probably just like middle age. I don't know, in their 40s, probably married men. And I remember really distinctly because one of them, when I was talking about, you know, my sexual misconduct, um, he told me he was talking about how we need to war against these fleshly desires. And he told me how, you know, for example, it's my very, he started to tell me about his marriage, like that I think essentially that him and his wife weren't really having sex and he found it very difficult to stay loyal to her. And I was like, dude, I'm like 18 years <laughs> old. Like, oh, why are you telling me this? Um, but yeah, it's at the time when you're raised in that culture, it seems like just what you have to do because if you hide it, then you will die at Armageddon. So the vehicle to being forgiven is to confess to these men. Um, it's odd looking back. Why do they need so many details? But they, in fact, are asked, you know, they're instructed to ask for these very personal details because certain things will determine whether you're repentant. Like, did you plan it? Did you enjoy it? I don't know. Did he come? Like, all of these things tell you that he didn't stop, you know, like, 
even though he could have. I mean, it's it's very weird. Um, when you're in a religion like that, definitely there is a lot of misogyny. Women are certainly kept in their place. And I have heard horror stories, much worse than mine, of how women have been treated in these, what they call judicial committees. Um, there's been women who have been raped and then told when they elders find out, they elders will disfellowship them, excommunicate them because they didn't scream when they were raped. I mean, there's cases where kids report child abuse, child molestation by a man in the congregation. And because there's not two witnesses to it, they just basically say, well, we are not going to do anything about it because we can't, we don't know that it's true. Mm -hmm. And also they tell the parents not to go to the authorities because uh, it would make the Jehovah's Witnesses look bad. So that's led to a whole litany of now it's coming out like serial child molestations in the Jehovah's Witnesses con congregations. So yeah, on a personal level, um, it's weird. It was weird. And it, and a lot of people, a lot of women have had uh, excruciating time trying to, you know, you know, in this process. And um, but, you know, when you're in it, that's just the way it is. And that was what you had to do to stay in it. Yeah. Yeah. The same, same, same thing with uh, why why religions are almost always against homosexuality. You know, it has something to do with, I think, you know, sort of evolutionary origins of religion. We need to grow our religion. There's only two ways to do it, converts uh, or make more babies. So yeah. we, we need to make sure you're on the straight and narrow, making babies in the right way. And you gay guys over there and lesbians over here, you're, you're taking two two at a time right out, of the, out of the breeding population. So we have to forbid this. You, you kind of see the logic yeah. of it. Well, one thing, too, though, is that you're looking at religions that is run by eight or so. It's gone up and down, eight or so men in Brooklyn. And, you know, for most of the history, eight to ten white men older. Right. So you've got a religion where these men hold absolute power over the adherents' lives because they t they profess to be the channel that God is using, you know, in right. this day and age. Right. And so you get a, you know, this is a problem. Like men have grasped hold of power, you know, thousands of years ago. And really in every religious tradition, which if you study even Buddhism, there's tons of misogyny because men have been the ones that have held the power. So if you look at this, Jehovah's Witnesses, I mean, how, how are eight men in Brooklyn going to decide to adjudicate over the lives of you know, eight million people? They're going to use their very male perspective and like doesn't it's kind of creepy. It doesn't turn out well. It's not a good idea. Yeah. You definitely, you definitely need like four women at least on that board to balance things out. But you know, even men, if men commit sexual sin, they too have to confess. It's culturally, I mean, you all have to do it, but I think it's a lot more humiliating for women for sure. I, I forget where uh, JWs are now on gay marriage. No, no, you cannot be gay. In fact, I've just been speaking online to one man who is, was, um, a witness and gay. And he told me that when he was a witness, he knew he was gay and he would confess because he's trying to fight it. And the elders told him that you should just go find a sister to marry. Um, and then just, that's the way, that's the solution to your problem. Like go find the best looking sister and marry her. I'm like, Oh, that's a really good solution. And just, also uh... like, what about the poor woman? Like, thanks a lot guys. Like, <laughs> So the, the idea in Jehovah's Witnesses is that it's a sin against the flesh, and it's just like any other sin, like immorality, that you just have to control yourself and be celibate, basically, if you're gay. And as I mentioned in my book, it's one brother in my congregation committed suicide. Yeah, that was he a was tragic story. Gay. Really and sad it's story. quite common. Yeah. You can't, like, you can't live like that. And it's it, there's so much shaming. And yeah, they're definitely never, I don't think, ever going to change that policy. Really? No. They yeah. don't adjust according to the time. I mean, look, they. I think they know that the blood transfusion thing is a mistake, but they won't go back because then it would mean admitting that they were wrong and being responsible right. for all of those deaths. Right. I'm pretty sure people on the inside know that that blood transfusion thing is a mistake. Yeah. But what can you do now? I guess it's that idea again, back to that. If you if you admit you're wrong about this one thing here, then <laughs> other things may fall. Most religions make adjustments that way. Um, I, I want to be mindful of your time. I know you have a hard out in about 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, you know, a big discussion in secular circles, particularly atheist circles, is if people leave religion, 
do we have to replace it with something? Do we need like a secular church, like a humanist movement? The Unitarian Universalists have churches. They're not really God believers so much. We need wedding ceremonies and funeral ceremonies that are secular and, you know, marriages and babysitting and, you know, the whole nine yards. Now, me personally, I, I'm not really into it's ceremonial stuff. So when I left my religion, I didn't feel the need to replace it. But I, I, I see a lot of my secular Jews, for example, they like going to, uh, you know, some kind of ceremony every week. And, and, you know, they like candles or they sing hymns or the food, the culture, the social capital. I get all that. What are your thoughts on, on, on the, the, the role that religion plays in the, the social aspects of, of humanity? Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, when I left my religion, I was so done. I just didn't want to be in a group where I was thrown together with these people, not because we shared necessarily like common interests or personality traits, but more like that the community was centered around a belief. But since being out, I've noticed that there's like, at least in New York City where I live, because there's so many people, this becomes very evident that there's all kinds of communities and people gather around different things. And they, these sort of like satellite things do not have to be gathered around a common belief. And to my mind, the people I've seen that are in a group because of a shared interest or book club, anything, children at a school, um, these kinds of communities can be just as warm and encouraging and also um, you know, in my case, my membership in that community was dependent on me staying adhering to something, a belief system. So I, I think that human beings are social creatures. And I think that we'll, we figure out ways, like we figure out ways to meet our needs and um, different people will have different ways of doing that. I mean, like I'm kind of, kind of an introvert. I have really close friendships now. I don't join groups. Like I'm not in I don't like yoga class. I don't know. Like I, <laughs> that's my personality, but I do have a social circle, a support system. Um, I think other people need it more. Like some people do want to seek out a group where they can do it regularly. Some people do love having ritual. And I think all those things are fine. And I honestly think, I think there's a place for religion. I think there's a place for non religious groups too. I think we already have that now. It's just that the problem for me is fundamentalist religion. When something is, you know, requires you to give up your family if you no longer want to be a member of the group, then I think that's a problem. And that's what I speak out about more now. Um, I also think that there's so many ways of being, like a lot of people seem to be very binary about this. It's like you're either religious or you're an atheist. And I just think that there's many ways of being um having a, an approach to life that I feel like our language doesn't really have the right word for it, but yeah. that is somewhere in the middle. And um, a large product of how I feel right now is I, I kind of threw out religion, like the baby with the bathwater for many years after I left my religion, because I just felt so turned off by it. But I've been taking, um, I've been going to university college in the background now for part time between working and having kids after leaving the witnesses, because as I said, we weren't allowed to get a degree. And I just started to sort of fell into taking all these religion classes. Mm. And it's been fascinating because just to look at how there's different ways of living a life that doesn't have to be connected to an organized religion, but yet can still be ethical and moral and have ritual or practice, um, can connect you to other people, can give you feelings of meaning. There's a lot of ways to do that, that you know, traditionally organized religion had the sort of stranglehold on that. And yeah. I think it made us think that it had, to, that it had to be, but I think we're learning that that doesn't have to be the case anymore. You know, maybe that was just a, a product of the cultural times back then that religion was the place that you could find that kind right. of connection. But now we have so much more information and, you know, works of literature and people and experts that around us that we can find different ways to meet those needs. It used to be, I think, in the '90s, a, a ethical culture society in New York City that was something like that, something like humanist. Yeah, yeah. I've, yeah, I've seen it around. Yeah, I haven't seen them much in the news. I don't know if they're still super active or whatever, but it's that idea. Um, particularly now, it's prominent because of the rise of the nuns. I mean, we're talking 25 percent of all Americans, 33 percent of millennials, probably over 40 percent of I Janers, Gen Zers, born after 1995, have no religion. Now, they're not necessarily atheists skeptics, whatever, they're just not affiliated with a religion. 
Yeah. So the question is, so a lot of us discuss this. What are where are they turning to? You know, uh, you know, uh, Putnam wrote that book, Bowling Alone. You know, we need social capital. We need groups to belong to. So a lot of them are turning to the secret and other new age type uh, mm. movements. I think you did, did. You write about the secret in your yeah. book, yeah. So you know, you just ask the universe. Oh, that's right. You ask the universe. I forget. Yeah, it, was kind of, it was kind of a bit of tongue in cheek, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, but so, but but again, people are turning. You know, I want something. Doesn't the universe care about me? No, the universe. <laughs> there is no caring for the what. Uh, you know that that seems to be part of our our human nature yeah. too. Um, well, and then at the end of your book, you drop this bombshell about the death of your son, which is really quite tragic. Um, but you 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 just sort of blew through that. I have a feeling you're going to write another book about this, or lost death and grief, or more of uh, volume two. I don't know what, what what are your thoughts on that? Since that you wrote this that chapter, and yeah. where where, um, do you, where do you go with that? It's funny because I wasn't originally going to include that in my book, but my editor said you can't not because thematically um, it's important to include, um, especially it's a memoir. It's like a big event in my life that my son passed away as a baby. Um, but she said, you know, you have to think about the way that this loss of religion and now you have to deal with this horrible tragedy. How does that, yeah. how do you do that? Because yeah. that is something that is important. And it's funny because, um, I've been doing some talks now more and I've been talking a lot more about that more than I did even in the book. Um, I think in the book, it's almost just a bit of like an epilogue almost. Yeah. And it could be a whole, another book. I don't think I'm going to write a book that is like a narrative book of what happened, but I have written a lot of articles about it. And one of the articles I wrote when my book came out, which was published in the New York times was about grief without religion and uh, that topic is, I think, a really important one because so many of us that don't have religion are going, we're all going to face loss. Yep. And how are we going to deal with that is a really important question. And uh, that's something that I've had to learn and found ways. I mean, of course, you never get over the loss of a child, but you do have to learn to live with it. So I have read about that. I'm kind of interested in writing another book that touches on it, um, but more in the sense of how in combination with other topics of just how do you live your life having left a fundamentalist religion and then come out and try to figure things out from, from the start. And that includes dealing with tragedy or death, among other things. If that had happened when you were a true believer as a witness, how would you have dealt with it? Would have it do you think it would feel any less terrible? Mm, you know what I've noticed? Cause I know quite a number uh, I've connected with other parents who have lost children now online and in person and some are religious. And I have noticed that even people who are religious it is the, the ultimate test of your faith. Most people, it doesn't help to have religion actually, cause it's that devastating. Yeah. And in fact it does, I know many people it's caused them to like question and maybe have a faith crisis. Um, cause it's hard, it's hard to put that into a cohesive narrative of God. Why would he have this healthy child be born perfectly healthy only to allow him to die? Um, so I, but you know, for me, I can definitely say that religion was always a bit of an escape from the more difficult parts of being human. So I do believe that, you know, my, my dad died when I was a witness and I was sad, but knowing that in your mind, when you're convinced that you will see that person again, it is much different than facing the con the conviction that you will not ever see them again. Yeah. Uh, so I think definitely, in a sense, you know, over the long term, it would have been more comforting to be religious. But that's what we have religion for, because it is comforting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My problem is, is that if it's not true, I don't find it comforting, and I don't believe, you know, I don't believe that there's those easy answers that there were when I was. A religious person. Yeah. Well, I guess it's to that, I, that article I sent you from the Wall Street Journal that everyone's been sending me, in which that psychotherapist says, uh, you know, here's some studies showing religion is good for societal health. It's good for people's health. They live longer. They're healthier. They're happier. They're psychologically more stable. Uh, what do you do if you're not a believer? Well, lie to your kids. Okay. What What is your response to to that kind of argument, which is fairly common? It was strange because when I read that article, I, it almost read like branded content. Like I found the tone of it very strange. It seemed like a person had a certain like agenda, but um, 
Because, I mean, I've read other studies that say the opposite yeah. or articles. Um, but basically what I, I think about that is that it's a, a strange thing how we, uh, again, what I was saying before, that we categorize, like, organized religion as religion. Like, all the things that she was talking about in that article about the things that religion can provide, you know, like this, impeti- this impulse to give or um, a feeling of connection to other, like, you know, as parents, we have res- so much responsibility as we raise children, if we have children. And in my case, I feel that religion kind of like, it was almost like farming your kid out to the religion and letting them do the work. And I think that, yes, it's not easy as a parent to raise a kid who um, will be an ethical person, but I don't think that you necessarily have to find that in religion. Um, I know many people, I have a friend who is not religious, who goes to the refugee camps in Greece and volunteers all summer when she's, Hmm. because she's a professor off of her work and she has a child now. And I know she'll bring her child to do these things. Like there are ways to raise our children to have gratitude without like hitching that on to organized religion. And I think it's fine if people do, but I also think it's fine if people don't. It's, It's about taking responsibility and making sure that you teach your kids about more than surface things. And even I think, the most atheist of atheists can still feel a sense of gratitude, can feel a sense of dependence, like in the sense that our lives are dependent on everything coming together at this moment to sustain our life. And I think all of those things are really spiritual, deep, like deep spiritual truths that can be had, even if a person doesn't believe in God. So um, I just, I just feel like all the things that are mentioned in that article are not things that are a monopoly of religion. Yeah. There's your next book. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, it's a it's a it's a hugely important topic because everybody cares about the deepest questions in life. Yeah, what is the meaning of life. How do I find purpose? You know, why is there evil? All that stuff. Uh, and religions pretty much had a monopoly on answering it, but but now philosophy and science and and so on can have something to say about it as well. There is research on this showing that, for example, people don't just want to be happy. You know, just just in some yeah. blissful state where you're just sitting in your you know couch and just you know feeling great. That's not what life is about. It's it's challenges. You got to get up and get yes. out of the house and get around yeah. and do something meaningful. You know, family, friends, meaningful work, having some purpose that's beyond you, having some long term goals that are beyond just tomorrow and in the immediate time and so on. D- those kinds of things. A lot of it is not fun to do. I was a caretaker for two of my four parents. I had step parents. And it wasn't fun at all. I mean, hauling my dad around to these doctors' offices and stuff, I didn't enjoy it, but I felt like a better person for it. And I think much of what we do, probably most of what we do is not fun. You don't think, oh, boy, I'm having so much fun sitting here. <laughs> it's, but but it, it gives your life meaning. And I think, you know, as we become less religious, you know, there'll be more need for finding those, or at least articulating or outlining what it is that gives people meaning. Yeah. And when I left, I remember this feeling of complete disorientation. Like I didn't know, you know, was it wrong to have sex or was it, you know, all these things that had been instructed to me, I had to figure out for myself. And I came through, like wrestled with a lot of that stuff and figured it out for myself. And then I realized the thing that mattered most to me, which I really try and want to teach to my daughter, who's a toddler now is just this sense of having a good character. And that when you align the actions in your life with a sort of like deep seated desire to just be a person of character, everything kind of flows from that. And I think what I love about it is that you're not doing it for this external reward. It's just this intrinsic thing that makes you feel good. Like before you think about it, it's like, I have sex. Oh my God, I got to go talk to the elders and tell them because God's going to kill me if I don't. This is not a really satisfying thing Mm. that makes you feel good about yourself. Like, oh, thank goodness they absolved me of my sin. You know, now I'm okay. No, (laughs) now it's harder to use your own internal moral compass. But the reason it works is because, as you say, it feels good to be a good person. Right. And I think that that's a real key because when I was being a good person before, I mean, fine, I was good enough. But I, I feel that the motivations were very different and therefore even the personal personal responsibility felt very different being good for goodness sake full stop full stop you don't there is we don't need another reason (laughs) yeah 
you know, that's one thought too many, like just uh, some extra layer. No, no, just for its own sake. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's, you know, that's sort of Kant's uh, principle of treating people not as a means to an end, but as an yeah. end in themselves. So, I mean, I think that that's the thing is that like re religion gave were laws and sometimes principles, but what we really need are principles. I think we have enough knowledge and we can do enough re research nowadays that we don't need it to be so like someone standing over us like a policeman. If we really truly want to, we can, you know, find the ethical way to live and live by principles that can guide us to, you know, without being like someone standing over you asking the details of your sex life. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Amber, I know you got to go pick up your toddler, speaking of toddlers and, uh, <laughs> Uh, again, congratulations on the book. Uh, I know Thanks if you. people Google you, they can find the, some articles you've written for the New York Times. And, and you're a writer now, professional writer. You're working full, full time as a writer, or part time. I mean, yeah, I work as a freelancer. I also as an editor. I worked for Scholastic. Oh, Scholastic, that's right. For yes. many years, and then um, I'm working on another sort of a co-writing project that um, is probably going to happen over the next year. Okay. So yeah, writing and editing of all sorts. Oh, good. Then we have more to look forward to. Thank you. <laughs> That's nice. Well, thanks again uh, for coming on and for being for, so open and brave uh, 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 talking about all this stuff. It's really Thank hard to really hard to do. Oh, it was, it was really nice. You're easy to talk to. <laughs> thanks. All right, Amber. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.